good morning children we are going to start our third session of the same chapter that is evolution and uh, in the earlier videos we discussed about the theories of origin of life we also discussed uh, the experimental proof what ure and miller gave and now we'll start with the evidences of evolution okay what are the evidences given by uh, different scientists on evolution so let us start okay now let us start with evidences of evolution now what does this uh, ev evidences actually mean actually these evidences are the proofs okay they are the proofs that tell us that a particular pattern of evolution that has taken place okay so that a particular pattern has taken place in during evolution is known as this evidences of evolution now these uh, evidences are of different types okay now uh, we have morphological and anatomical evidences we have uh, paleontological evidences we have embryological evidences we have biogeographical evidences we have molecular or genetic evidences now all these five type of evidences we have now one by one we will be dealing with all the types of evidences to start with will be uh, means uh, first dealing with the morphological or anatomical evidences now to understand this uh, morphological or anatomical evidences uh, there are some uh, categories or some organs which prove us that how these morphological or anatomical evidences uh, help us in understanding that how evolution has taken place okay so let us start with uh, morphological and anatomical evidences under which we will deal with homologous organs first now first we will understand what are homologous organs so these homologous organs have same structure and origin structure and origin means they are developed from the same tissue and they have typical same type of structure okay but they perform different functions now they have the same structure and origin but they perform different functions we can understand this with a help of couple of examples okay now the first example we see here uh, that uh, the first example which i have written here four limbs of horse and hands of man now how these two are homologous to each other homologous means they will be having same structure and origin but will perform different functions see four limbs of horse and hands of man are made up of same bones and same muscles but they work in a different way they function in a different way how they have same muscles same tissues the bones and everything the muscles everything is same but horse uses the four limbs for what running and hands of man are used for grasping things isn't it similarly the next example is flippers of whale are homologous to hands of man so flippers of whale are homologous to or or whale or seal okay are has uh, homologous to hands of man how flippers and hands both are made up of same muscles and bones that is same tissues but are used in different way or function differently how whale 
or seal uses their flippers for swimming and hands of man are used for grasping things okay now next uh, first two i gave of animals next two are of uh, plants thorns of bougainvillea and tendrils of cucurbita now cucurbita and bougainvillea the thorns thorns and uh, of bougainvillea and the tendrils of cucurbita both arise from the same uh, axillary bud okay they arise from the axillary bud i think all of you both of I means all my students know about axillary buds they arise from the axils of the leaf and these have the same origin and structure but again function differently how bougainvillea the thorns are used for protection and tendrils are used for support or for climbing okay next in opuntia the stem opuntia means cactus type of cactus the stem becomes flat and green to store water the stem becomes flat and green to store water and also photosynthesize whereas the stem of other plants what they do mainly give support okay photosynthesis also is done because they have little bit of chlorophyll but main function is support so you can see here the stem has origin the origin wise they are both same that is of opuntia and other plants but in case of opuntia it has become flat and green to store water and photosynthesize but here it is mainly giving in other plants it is mainly giving support now children how you will understand uh, means uh, that these morphologic this homologous organs how what is this their significance and how we can understand their role in evolution okay now see i have written the significance also there they show common ancestry common ancestry means what they have origin means their origin is from a common ancestor and divergent evolution what does divergent evolution mean divergent means individuals of the same group okay they had the same ancestors okay they are of, of all of same group or same species but they have undergone adaptive modifications adaptive modifications why modifications so that they can adapt in different environments and have become different thus they have become different so what they are trying to tell that species which are of same type of same group of animals they origin wise their structure wise they are same but they because of some reasons they were placed in different habitats or topography or environment due to which they have undergone these adaptive modifications so that they can adjust in that surrounding clear so that like this we can understand how homologous organs show or give us the evidence of evolution now the next one under this morphological and uh, uh, anatomical category only is the analogous organs How, what are analogous organs first we'll see that analogous organs are having different structure and origin see in homologous organs they have same structure and origin but here they have different structure and origin in analogous organs but they perform the same function okay so just opposite of what homologous told have different structure and origin but perform same functions now uh, let us understand with some examples wings of birds and wings of insects now birds and birds uh, their wings are formed by bones okay and uh, the feathers are attached to it all the bones as, as we have in the forelimb and all the wings of birds also have the same bones but the uh, wings of insects are uh, mainly they are made up of uh, chitinous they have a chitinous exoskeleton okay so chitinous exoskeleton they have so the, we can see a different structure and origin the wings of insects do not have any bones in them so different structure and origin but they perform the same function what is the same function that is for flying clear now the next example eye of cephalopod cephalopods means you can take uh, octopus here okay so the eyes of cephalopods and the eyes of may, man they all or both have the same function that is to perceive visual stimuli that is for uh, observing something for seeing something but they are made up of different tissues their origin is different fins of fish and the flippers of whale fins of fish are made up of different uh, this one uh, structure or that is their origin is different but in case of uh, flippers of whale they are made up of different uh, structure or origin so what we can see that the fins of fish and flippers of whales are analogous analogous how 
because they are different in structure and origin but they are functioning in the same way that is they are used for swimming. Next is phylloclad of Opuntia. Phylloclad you know that is uh, the stem which has been uh, means which has become flat and green okay to store water and photosynthesize. So these phylloclad of Opuntia and the leaves of other plants they are analogous to each other. How? Phylloclad of Opuntia photosynthesize okay leaves of other plants also photosynthesize so same function but origin is different because phylloclad the origin is what stem but in case of leaves leaves are from de uh, developed from the their own structure and origin that is from the leaves okay the next one potato and sweet potato are analogous to each other potato and sweet potato what is their function to store food but origin wise they both are different potato develops is a modification of uh, stem and sweet potato is a modification of what root yes okay now if we see the significance how these uh, analogous organs uh, help in understanding that is they form the evidences for evolution now these analogous organs show convergent evolution what do you mean by convergent evolution now if distantly related organisms distantly means they are totally different the species wise how they have originated Okay, next uh, under this the morphological and anatomical evidences itself, we will talk about vestigial organs. Okay, so uh, the vestigial organs are the organs which are present in reduced form. You all know about this vestigial organs. They are present in our body in reduced form and do not perform any function in our body. They have no functions in our body. That's why they are called as vestiges. Now, what or uh, how does this vestigial organs uh, show us the evidence? The of evolution how this means that these organs were fully functional in our ancestors means they were present in our ancestors but uh, as the habit the habitat or habits changed of the, our ancestors these were not needed anymore by uh, the organisms and that's why they have gradually reduced to vestiges okay this is the reason how they give us evidences now let us take up uh, some examples so in humans we take up uh, some examples like nictitating membrane I hope all of you are aware of uh, this nictitating membrane. These uh, nictitating membrane uh, is also known as plica semilunar, uh, semilunaris. Okay, this nictitating membrane is also known as the third eyelid, and you can see that uh, this nictitating membrane is present in uh, frogs and all those uh, aquatic amphibians. Okay, now how this nictitating membrane uh, functions? It is a, a transparent one. Uh, we have two eyelids. The upper one is the first. The lower one is the second eyelid, and this nictitating membrane is a third eyelid okay so in uh, means it uh, indicates that our ancestors might uh, have been aquatic due to which this nictitating membrane was that time present but as they have become or changed their mode of life they have become terrestrial so this nictitating membrane has reduced and can you uh, do you know which part is this nictitating membrane in the inner corner of our eyes can you see a pink colored this one mm, structure that pink colored structure on the inner side of our eye uh, is the nictitating membrane. Okay, it is a reduced form of the nictitating membrane. So, it is a vestigial organ. Now, uh, vermiform appendix, all of you are aware of vermiform appendix is uh, present in the, at the cecum end of the large intestine and it is full, it was fully functional in our ancestors because probably they were uh, uh, eating too much of uh, vegetables or vegetables means uh, this uh, green uh, leafy uh, vegetables. That's why cellulose. Vermiform appendix mainly has ha, uh, present in these herbivorous animals which secrete an um, uh, enzyme which is known as cellulase which helps in digesting cellulose. So, our uh, change of food habit uh, re uh, resulted in uh, this decreased function of the vermiform appendix. Wisdom teeth again, our mode of changing of food habit has, uh, we know that uh, means uh, wisdom teeth is a molar teeth, isn't it? Now, the more we chew things, our molars are functional. So, probably uh, when our ancestors were herbivores or they used to eat too much of green leafy vegetables, their molars were more used. But in our case, uh, now in fully formed uh, individuals like us, what happens? These molars sometimes or these wisdom teeth do not come out also. Why? Because our food uh, habits have changed. We uh, uh, Previously, they never used to cook food. Our ancestors never used to cook food. So everything was eaten raw 
but in our case we we are cooking everything so most of the things are already in uh, cooked form so less use of molars is there hence this wisdom teeth sometimes are not uh, coming out means do not do not come out in many individuals also so they are considered as vestiges auricular muscles are those muscles of the ear pinna the muscles of the ear pinna are known as the auricular muscles they are functional in some animals like cats dogs which can move their ear pinna but now uh, means it is uh, non functional in human beings and that's why they are considered as vestiges probably they were functioning in our ancestors because they used to live in jungles and they uh, used to maybe use these auricular muscles to hear the sounds of animals and other things okay mammary glands in males okay in males the mammary glands are vestigial clitoris which is a reduced form of uh, penis in females is again a vestigial organ cocyx or the co uh, this coccygeal region of our uh, vertebral column this cocyx bone is again a vestige which is sometimes uh, seen as a small rudimentary tail in some of the babies okay okay let us come to other animals in flightless birds the wings are vestigial okay they don't use the uh, wings they are vestigial in python what happens these uh, the vestiges of pelvic girdle are found in the form of small uh, protrusions okay they are vestiges of the pelvic girdle so that actually pelvic girdle is mainly used for what attachment of the limb bones or uh, the hind limb bones so probably their ancestors of python might have those small uh, uh, legs attached to the pelvic girdle which have uh, now uh, can be seen as small vestiges in the form of these uh, in the, in in these python that is the, in these organisms in horses the splint bones are found which are reduced ridges i don't know how many of you have noticed but uh i think all of you know that the one of the toe is very big in these horses and at the back you can see some small small bones on the top part these are known as the splint bones they are actually the reduced digits okay the carpals metacarpals have reduced and they are reduced as splint bones they are not used only the third digit is used as the hoof which is forms the uh, middle uh, hoof okay so this these have reduced into these splint bones which are again these reduced digits now uh, let us go into the next category of evidences that is the embryological evidences we have finished with the morphological evidences we'll now deal with the embryological evidence now uh, for the first point which i have written under embryological evidences is similarity in early development of triploblastic animals now uh, these uh, examples will help us in understanding how these uh, evidences have given uh, or the, how these examples have given proof that uh, the, these are evidences of evolution or how evolution has taken place okay so similarity in early development of triploblastic see embryological that's why everything is related to early development okay so early development of triploblastic animals triploblastic means having three germ layers now whenever we are talking about triploblastic animals means we'll start with platyhelminthes and the last one is the are the mammals now what they are trying to tell is the uh, during the early development of uh, these triploblastic animals from platyhelminthes to mammals all are same that is they start their life from zygote a single cell that is zygote then they move to the next stage that is morula then to the next stage that is blastula then to the next stage is glastula and then from in the glastula part by the process of glastulation the three germ layers that is the ectoderm mesoderm and the endoderm are formed so what is uh, seen that all the there is these uh, uh, higher uh, class mammals uh, these organisms mammals what their early development is it is similar to the lower category of animals that is the platyhelminthes so there is a common line of ancestry okay okay coming to the next one resemblance resemblance in early embryonic development in vertebrates vertebrates mean, means uh, who were will be the animals here from fish uh, till up to mammals all these animals will be taken in this category now resemblance in early embryonic development means if you look at the embryos of fish lizard pigeon rabbit and man you will see that during early stages of development their embryo are very uh, similar to each other they look alike and if they if you place the embryos of all these organisms from uh, fish to uh, man you will not be able to distinguish which is of the fish and which is of the lizard or which is of the rabbit okay they are so close to each other so uh, what they are trying to tell is that they all have similar head with eye and 
uh, ear buds that is the rudiments of the ears and eyes gill clefts are there notochord is there and embryonic tail is also there means an embryo of a fish uh, will uh, the parts of the which these embryo of fish will have the same parts the embryo of a man will have uh, yes it happens that uh, in the later stages of development these uh, structures uh, get omitted uh, from the uh, embryo okay so we can see the common lines of ancestry that is uh, fish that is the lower vertebrates and higher vertebrates that is the mammals they have same kind of early embryonic resemblance coming to the uh, main one that is uh, the next point of under embryological uh, evidences is recapitulation theory what is this recapitulation theory and the theory and who proposed it it was proposed by von baer okay von baer proposed it and what does it tell it states that during embryonic development the generalized feature that is the basic structure okay the generalized features uh, which are common in all vertebrates they will appear first and then the specialized characters which will which will appear so what does this theory tell this theory tells that the basic characters like brain spinal cord and axial skeleton all these structures are formed first which is common to all uh, the vertebrates all uh, type of vertebrates have these characters then after these basic characters or basic features are formed then the special features are uh, means come into the scene or gets formed that means special features means hair in animals is a, uh, a very important feature or special feature feathers in case of birds is a special feature limbs in case of quadrupeds it is the uh, terrestrial animals okay tetrapods they are also the special features the so first the generalized structures or the basic structures will get formed in all vertebrates from fish to uh, this uh, uh, mammals and then the special features are formed okay that is uh, these uh, limbs in uh, tetrapods feathers in birds and etc now this recapitulation theory was modified okay we will see this in the next slide that is this recapitulation theory was modified into uh, by under a different name which is known as the biogenetic law or biogenetic theory let us see in the next slide now we were talking that uh, this recapitulation theory was uh, uh, the modified version or uh, means so it's modified version the modified version of this recapitulation theory is biogenetic law now biogenetic law was given by ernest haeckel now what does this law say it states that ontogeny repeats phylogeny now for understanding uh, this uh, sentence or phrase we need to first understand that what does ontogeny mean and what does phylogeny mean now this ontogeny means the own developmental history okay the organism's own developmental history okay and phylogeny means the when it's, it's its ancestral developmental history the ancestral the developmental history of its ancestor now if i put this uh, meanings of this two what does the phrase means then this phrase or the sentence means that an organism during its own development goes through or passes through its ancestral development okay that is an organism during its own development means when an organism is developing when it uh, undergoes its development it passes through the development of its ancestors how uh, let us uh, take a couple of examples now see for example i have written in the development of frog a fish like tadpole larva is formed which swims with the help of tail and respires by gills so what they are trying to tell is when this frog was developing means when this frog is developing means its own developmental history during its own developmental history of the frog it undergoes a ancestral development uh, developmental history that is it uh, looks like a tadpole larva means this tadpole larva looks like a fish which swims and has tail and also respires by gills so its ancestors that is like a fish it looked when it was developing but uh, later on when it developed into a normal adult all these characters were lost but during its development it had some ancestral characters of fish so it indicates that frog has evolved from a fish like ancestor similarly one more example is given in the slide you can see gymnosperms have descended from a pteridophyte like uh, ancestor it's it uh, this one uh, tells that gymnosperms have 
come up from a pteridophyte like ancestor. What does this mean? This means that the gymnosperms are not dependent on water, okay, for fertilization, but their flagellated sperms, okay, and dependency on water for fertilization as found in pteridophytes occurs in some primitive gymnosperms like cycus and ginkgo. Means cycus and ginkgo, which are the uh, primitive gymnosperms, for them, their uh, this fertilization part, the flagellated sperm swims with the help of water during fertilization. So, this is a similarity with their ancestors, which are like the pteridophytes. So, this uh, shows that this ontogeny repeats the phylogeny. Now, coming to the next set of evidences, that is paleontological evidences. First of all, what does paleontology mean? Paleontology means that is the, it is or it is the study of fossils of animals. Uh, and plants that lived in the past means now they are not living they used to live and their fossils are being studied that is that is what uh, what what all this study of uh, or uh, this paleontology means or, or is all about now what does this fossil mean fossils are the actual remains okay remains or traces or the impressions left by organisms which have been preserved in the rocks rocks means generally they take up this this sedimentary rocks okay uh, uh, means is taken under consideration or sometimes igneous also okay now these fossils are the definition of fossils and paleontology both you have to learn and uh, coming to the father of paleontology was uh, Leonardo da Vinci Vinci and uh, this uh, father of modern paleontology is uh, considered the person who is considered as the father of modern paleontology is G. Cuvier okay now uh, if we talk about this uh, significance of this uh, paleontology uh, we will again take uh, some uh, uh, this uh, examples okay see the first significance which i have written there is the distribution of fossils in the successive strata which shows that bottom rocks had simpler fossils but the upper rocks has had much evolved fossils now what does this mean this means that when the uh, means uh, these paleontologists were digging through the layers of the rocks, what they saw that the bottom rocks had simpler fossils, means they, are, they were less evolved, okay. But the upper rocks had more evolved ones, okay. Evolved ones means they were more adapted to the surroundings, they had more features which were much more, uh, uh, showed much more evolution than the uh, uh, lower, uh, means uh, simpler fossils which were at the bottom rocks. So, this was, uh, uh, this is the significance of the paleontological evidences, what they can understand from the fossils. That is, the simpler ones are, are lower, be, uh, in the lower strata or the lower layers and the more evolved one are in the upper layers. That means, they were formed later on, the more evolved ones and the less evolved ones were deep inside the rocks. Now, next one I have written missing links. Now, what do you mean by missing links? Missing links actually are uh, the fossils uh, organisms, the fossil organisms which were there but are not present now, they are extinct now and they use, they showed uh, the characters of two different groups, okay. They showed the character of two different uh, groups and uh, I mean, so which are now present or uh, means present living forms. So, these uh, are the missing links, means they are not present now, they are already extinct but they show the characters of the present day forms, living forms which are now there. For example, I have given a uh, 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 example of Archaeopteryx lithographica. Okay, questions are asked from this also. Archaeopteryx lithographica. This is a link between reptiles and birds. Means this Archaeopteryx had both the features of reptiles as well as it has had features of the birds. And this uh, uh, was this uh, fossil was first obtained by Andreas Wagner. So let us see the uh, different. Uh, characters of reptiles and the different characters of birds which were present in this uh, Archaeopteryx in the next slide. Now, the reptilian characters which were present in uh, Archaeopteryx were the presence of teeth in the jaws which is a reptilian character because birds do not have teeth. Finger, uh, so fingers terminate into in a claw, this, this is a reptilian character. Sternum which is the breastbone is without a key, okay. Uh, presence of free caudal vertebra as in Lizard. So, pre-caudal vertebra was present in the uh, these uh, this Archaeopteryx, which is only present in the reptiles and not in the birds. Now, the avian characters. Presence of feathers on the body is the avian character, which was which is present in Archaeopteryx. It has two jaws, which are modified into a beak. The forelimbs 
are modified into two wings and they do not have four limb, limb. Uh, and limb bones and the girdles are bird like the limb bones and the girdle uh, girdle was a little bit of bird like and it has the uh, this uh, uh, furcula is there which you will read in the book furcula actually is the um, it is attached to the sternum it uh, helps in attachment of the uh, this flight muscles okay it is also present in this but not fully developed but it was present in this uh, archaeopteryx lithographica so these were some of the characters and uh, my dear children that they are asked in the examination name some of the reptilian characters as well as avian characters of archaeopteryx now let us come to the geological time scale which is given in your syllabus what do you mean by geological time scale and you have to uh, do this in, uh, in accordance with the flora and fauna uh, which was present now geological time scale is the record of the life forms and geological events in the earth's history Okay, what all things or what all life forms were present in the earth's history, all these are recorded in the geological time scale. Now, the history of earth has been divided into a number of major divisions. What are the major divisions? They are the eras and the eras are subdivided into periods. So the higher division is the eras, then the lesser division is again subdivided into periods and these modern periods are again further divided into epochs. The time scale with dominant flora and flora is given in the uh, table which I am showing in the next. See, in this slide, though it is a bit uh, hazy, but uh, I think you will be able to understand. See the eras, Cenozoic era, Mesozoic era, Paleozoic era, uh, Proto, uh, Proterozoic era, era and Archaeozoic era, era. All these are the zera, eras which were an Azoic era, which was uh, which were present in the I means the geological time scale has these eras. Now the Cenozoic is divided into Quaternary and Tertiary, and this Mesozoic era is divided into Cretaceous, Jurassic, and Triassic, and uh, this Paleozoic is to into per, uh, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian, uh, Silurian, Ordovician, and Cambrian. Okay, and this uh, Pro uh, Proterozoic uh, has does not have any divisions as such. Only the number of uh, this uh, millions of years is written there. And children, uh, in your syllabus, it's written according to the flora and fauna present. So you can see also the flora and fauna which was present in that time uh, is given in this uh, table. Uh, and uh, one more uh, thing, children, uh, just see that uh, this one is from. It is from. Uh, see the last part. You see that is from the origin of solar system where there was no life. That is the last. Means the first thing has been given at the last. And uh, the present day or uh, means the present period is given in the first, that is it is the Cenozoic. And the first one when uh, life originated and means there was no life and the origin of solar system had, had just taken place, that is Azoic era. So this is all given here when angiosperms came, when did uh, the uh, Jura, this, uh, uh, what we call this uh, dinosaurs came and all these things, when they evolved, everything is given in this table, just go through it nicely, okay. Coming to the next slide. Now, what does this uh, biogeographical evidence, uh, what evidences these uh, give uh, for evolution? We'll understand this. What does biogeographical uh, uh, or what does rather biogeography means? It is the study of distribution of animals and plants on the earth's surface. That is biogeography. Now, the first example which we have taken under this biogeographical evidences is Darwin's finches. Okay. Now, uh, when uh, why it is known as first of all these finches are what? These are small size blackbirds. Okay, and these small size blackbirds were found in Galapagos Island. And where is this Galapagos Island? And what is all about these islands? That these are these consist of twenty two islands, small islands. Okay, and these islands were placed in the west coast of uh, South America. Now, why Darwin's finches? Because Darwin was on on his voyage, okay, uh, and the probably the ship's name was uh, HMS Beagle, and he was on his voyage, and he landed up in this Galapagos Island, and what he noticed was that there was a bird. Uh, there were uh, means these finches. These he noticed these birds. There were uh, nearly thirteen species of these finches, okay. Uh, which he grouped under uh, six main types that is uh, uh, the large ground finches, uh, cactus uh, ground finches feeding on the cacti, uh, vegetarian tree finches, insectivorous tree finches, warbler finches means which can make very musical sounds, they are warbler finches, tool using or woodpecker finches. Okay, These are different uh, means, uh, six main types of finches which he saw, he saw. 
now what he uh, came into a conclusion that these uh, this all these finches actually came from a ancestral finch which were seed eating the ancestral finch which was a seed eating finch when it was uh, there and when these islands uh, were uh, not formed means uh, when the islands into the 22 islands when these uh, ancestral finches they got distributed in these 22 islands according to the food which was available this ancestral form changed into this sixth category of uh, finches that is the large ground finches the cactus eating finches okay which fed on cactus uh, and uh, vegetarian tree finches insectivorous tree finches warbler or the sound musical sound which is made by the finches they are the warbler finches and the woodpecker finches so what happened this ancestral finch when they distributed themselves in this 22 islands according to food which was available they changed their features or the uh, and their features were mainly changed on the structure of their beak okay because the feeding habit is there so their uh, difference all the uh, finches they differed from one another mainly on their size the size and mostly on the structure of their beak according to the feeding habit in which island they were placed in so this is according to the what we see here that here also divergent evolution is there that means a common ancestral form is there but according to the different type of biogeography means different areas where they have shifted to into the small islands they have changed their structures or their features okay now coming to the discontinuous distribution under this biogeographical evidence what is it was believed that millions of years ago all the present day continents which you see now that is uh, this america two americas africa india asia sorry uh, australia all were in a uh, means big chunk of uh, mass of land big uh, land mass and this big big land mass was known as pangaea and uh, you can see the diagram also which i have put there later what happened they broke off and they drifted apart from one another okay due to this geographical change that is this drifting and all uh, shifted the island to their normal position which we see now so what we what happened due to this that it was a pangaea large big mass and now why they are uh, why they have come come into this conclusion why for example uh, for example the elephants which are found in africa and india why elephants are found only in Africa and India means if we are not considering the Jews that is a different thing okay because cap in captivity men in zoos many things can be brought from far away but in natural in their natural habitat why elephants are found only in Africa and India and not in many other uh, continents because you can see in this diagram this Africa and India was very close were very close together okay and when these uh, continents drifted apart only in these two continents these elephants were Found. Similarly, the lung fishes were only, uh, only found in these three uh, 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 continents, it is uh, America, Africa and Australia. You can see from this diagram of Pangaea that South America was intact with Africa from one side, isn't it? Can you see? And when this, uh, due to geographical changes, these two islands also uh, moved apart, only the lung fishes were found in these three places, that is America, South America africa and australia this is the reason of their discontinuous distribution and that's why they are present in separate areas because previously the um, continents uh, were in a in the form of a big land mass which was known as pangaea later on they drifted apart that's why some of the organisms are exclusively present in some of the uh, continents and not in all okay coming to the next slide okay coming to the molecular and genetic evidence now what is this molecular and genetic from the name only you can understand uh, means how much uh, similarity is there in the molecular structure of important biomolecules okay you know about the biomolecules now how much similarity is there that we'll see okay and how this evidence is uh, helpful now uh, molecular uh, homology means similarity in the molecular structure of important biomolecules this indicates what that is the degree of closeness between them degree of closeness how much closeness is there between the organisms 98.2 percent of homology is found in the base sequence of dna of man and chimpanzee so the base sequence of dna matches nearly 98.2 percent in man as well as chimpanzees blood group in man that is r a b a b and o apes have blood groups a b and a b 
monkeys do not have this a b or o so indicates that monkeys are not that much closely related to human beings or man the, the ones which are more closely related are the apes okay because there is more homology in their blood groups similarly universal genetic code that all organisms usually uh, have this dna to store information genetic information except some viruses that is most of the organisms which we see they have dna as the genetic material and uh, except some of the viruses atp is the main energy currency in all living organisms or all living cells that is atp is used as a main energy source in all the living cells and not any other because gtp is also there um, it, uh, this uh, ttp is also there but atp is the main energy currency of the living cells are not any other currency okay anything other uh, alternative is not used in the living cells okay now children so we uh, come to the end of this session and i'll be back with the next uh, lesson very soon so go through the video lesson very nicely take the help of the book which is given there because the diagram of the embryos and all these things are nicely given in the book so you can match that and you can uh, understand more clearly go through the lesson very nicely hear it several times so that you uh, everything all the concept and everything is clear uh, so hopefully we will meet soon